equal access and a safe access, I think it's very important. You also have to empower women to come to the front stage. The additional value of gender planning is that you take into consideration the different needs in a systematic way. Welcome to Breaking Paradigms, a podcast where we talk about global perspectives on spatial planning in practice and theory by Constance Frech and Sarah Kuschel. In this episode, we talk about gender justice and how gender mainstreaming got a foothold in spatial planning, both in urban and rural places. Since Austria, and especially Vienna, are pioneers in this field, we decided to do one episode with experts specifically from Austria. The international perspective will be central in our next episode. We talked to three women who were part of the gender planning movement from the very beginning and who did extraordinary pioneer work in this field. There are strategic needs and practical needs. Doris Damjanovic is an associate professor at the BOKU in Vienna, Austria, in the Institute of Landscape Planning, and her PhD and habilitation focused on gender mainstreaming on the local level. She teaches and does research in the fields of participatory planning and gender mainstreaming and planning, and has more than 20 years of experience on the topic. Recently, she published a book on European strategies in gender mainstreaming. It's actually, it's not really a burden, but I think it's really an added value. Petra Hirschler is an urban and regional planner and works at the Technical University of Vienna. She's been connected with the topic of gender in planning through her practical work in rural areas. Her PhD led her more into depth research on the topic and recently she was heavily involved in the celebration of 100 years of women's admittance to the Technical University with multiple projects. Safety and the subjective feeling of security is different between men and women. Eva Keil is a spatial planner and pioneer in the mainstreaming of gender in planning. She was the first head of the women's office for the municipality of Vienna and currently she runs a unit which focuses on gender planning issues in the executive office for construction and technology for the city of Vienna. She's internationally renowned for her work and for pioneering a practical approach to gender mainstreaming. During my study of uh, urban design and spatial planning at the Technical University of Vienna, I already read quite a lot of feminist literature, but I made no connections to the topic of my study. And this was during my work when I worked in City Hall of Vienna. Um, we realized an exhibition uh, about to whom does public space belong to uh, women's everyday life in the city. And this was, I can say, the beginning of planning orientated on, on women issues first, but then later on gender planning issues. My connection to the topic of gender planning actually started by a coincidence in 2001. At that time I was still working with a, a regional planning office and uh, I, it was just a phone call by a regional manager of a province in Austria, a very yeah, a more rural province actually. And they had a request to start a project in the field of gender mainstreaming. And I was asked to develop a project. And at that time, I didn't know anything about gender planning because when I was educated, it wasn't a topic at all in the curriculum. And also, uh, I was already working for three years that time in regional planning. Uh, and also in these three years, the topics didn't occur. So I started researching and uh, I must commit that it was a very special thing getting into this gender planning because it really changed my perspective a lot on how planning is done, how are people represented in planning and how we deal with people uh, in spatial planning. How would you define gender planning and what are the gendered aspects of planning? 
what we really try, uh, what I assume is the gender approach is in planning, but also we have also in a university with a lot of natural sciences and engineering, uh, that we really want to support the everyday life situation of people in their different life phases and also to open a perspective for sustainable development on all planning levels. But to make it a little bit more clear, what does this mean? Uh, we try really to first to understand the different perspectives and interests of people, user, user groups, but how, um, how they use the space and consider gender or genders, age, life situation, but also ethnic, cultural and social background. So it's not only gender, it's a lot of other intersectionalities which I think are important when you use space or if you participate in the planning process. We understand it that it's on one hand an analytic tool to understand how people use space, how people uh, take part in participatory processes. So I think this is one part. The other part is really to integrate a gender perspective from the, it's a very, pro, planning is a very process oriented uh, discipline. So it's very important to start from the beginning on to think about gender issues from the uh, uh, analysis to the different stages of the planning uh, process. Really also when you, when you formulate the objectives, but also when you think about implementation measures. So it's a, it's very important to think uh, agenda as an analytic category in all stages of the, of the planning process. And then it's a question also of culture, I think. So that's another level that you have to think about what's, what are your values in planning? For whom are you planning? What is your um, uh, yeah, attitude when you think about planning? For whom I am coming from an um, agenda approach? I think it's also to really clarify what are your values and where you want to go. So I think you have there are a lot of dimensions when you are talking about uh, gendered approaches or gender in planning. And I think one other thing is um, uh, gender um, is different. I think there are different debates in when you look on the scientific debates which have more space to think about analytic things, about questioning the debate. And then we are working very practical with the administration, with the cities, also with rural municipalities. I think it's very important to think uh, on what level you are at the moment and which people you're talking to, which stakeholders are here. So I think you have on one side, you have to also be a, a little bit be pragmatic uh, to really bring it also to the, to the people or to the planners and to the, the, the practitioners. And uh, when we debated in, uh, with the city of Vienna, or also in the book, uh, we have quite a broad understanding of, of, of the gender approach. So as I said before, we, it's not only the gender category or sex category. We, we think a lot about other categories like age, race, ethic, and social background, or also the big debates on sexual orientation. So it's a broader debate on the scientific level, I would say. And, Gender planning is actually inside everything, I would say. And for me, it's about possibilities, also taking into account uh, different uh, perspectives and different uh, people and persons and trying to yeah, consider all the needs in space uh, and in spatial planning so that you really have a quite sensible approach on how you plan and how you design the future. So uh, for me, there is not a single aspect in planning which is not connected to, to gender planning, yeah, because it's always about people uh, and we are all different, which of course is a huge challenge uh, on the other side because it, it's almost impossible to, to have all the needs covered, but at least I think we should try. So this is my definition, actually, on gender planning. Gender planning, in my definition, is a specific form of quality assessment of planning processes. It takes into account the different need of different groups. For planning issues, important is that there is the, the 
spatial needs or the in-city organization of care work and family work. It's also about mobility issues because also due to income situation there, the availability of different modes of transports are different for men and women, for example. But also statistical data show that there are also differences even in car use by men and women. So the, there are differences and also the topic of safety and the subjective feeling of security is different between men and women and this also has an influence on their personal mobility but also leisure and sport interests there you really find different interests and different patterns of use of spatial issues and gender planning the additional value of gender planning is that you take into consideration the different needs of different user groups or potential user groups in a systematic way and in regard of a fair share of space or financial means. And I think the value of this topic takes place when it comes to the situation that you have to decide conflicts of targets. And I think in planning, from the planning profession, this is really crucial that you have to decide conflicts of targets all the time. And in the mainstream planning, this is discussed under functional aspects. You discuss it between green use and building areas, for example. But it's not systematically discussed what are the importance or the impacts on the different groups, because they are quite different. What specific efforts can urban or rural areas make to improve in terms of gender justice? There is indeed a big gap between urban and rural areas. In rural areas, uh, women, and then it comes again to these typical gender roles, are not very well represented in politics. And of course, then have a far smaller influence on how communities develop, even though if they are actually often the ones who keep the social life alive uh, in these rural areas, because they are taking care on the social connections and so on, but they are not represented on the political side. It's really hard to change behaviors and perspectives on exactly those things. And it's even harder in rural areas because uh, it's a question of generations because they are far more connected to their traditions. And of course, you also have to empower women to come to the front stage yeah, because it has to do a lot with self-esteem actually. yeah that you really have to take the responsibility and have to be uh, yeah, the one or the person then in the first line, which is not so, so easy to take in especially smaller communities. I remember also we had a lot of project ideas, for example, for the empowerment of women, to that they really do an active role in politics. There also used to be a lot of projects in that field in the yeah, around 2005 but they were more or less successful. Yeah, if you look at the figures, we are still down to 8% of female uh, mayors in Austria, which is really not much. And the funny statistic is that there are more mayors with the name Joseph than females. Yeah, So this is just a, yeah, a funny thing. But I also see that over the years there has been a small increase, but it's really a very, very long process. If you look on the federal level, there the developments are much, much faster. We have more female ministers now than male ones. So you see um, the upper the level gets the faster uh, gender planning or the gender representatives are uh, implemented. But if it really gets to the very small size and uh, rural areas, it takes a long, long time. And... Also, I must say that there was a peak on gender projects um, yeah, around 2000, 2010, where there, this was really a top topic. Uh, there were plenty of, especially European Union programs to push gender uh, equality on all levels and also in all fields. But this is more or less gone. Now you can say, okay, it's mainstream by now. I wouldn't say that. 
but at least it's somehow still on the agenda, but not with such a importance, I would say. Summing up, there is a lot of things to do, especially in the rural areas. And for me, especially the political representation is one key aspect because it's the access to money. Uh, it's the access also to visibility. But there it's slowly, slowly changing. And there is often also this excuse that there are no qualified females, which is just bullshit. Yeah. And by what I also learned is that you just have to insist on that. Yeah. That from I, for me, for example, made up the rule that I'm not playing a quota female anymore. So if there is not at least a second female or even 50% of females, I don't participate in the conference or yeah, what, whatsoever. Because yeah, I think there are, it's absolutely possible that you have uh, equal representation of males and females. And it's just not true that there are not enough qualified colleagues outside in every field, actually. Yeah. In planning, we always have uh, the goal or the objective that we not only want to, uh, to analyze something, we all want to, to implement something or have mm -hmm. ideas how you can really implement it in, in the everyday life practice. So I think it's a good question how you can improve it. And I, I, I like the idea there's a colleague... I think she's working in the Global South, uh, Molly Nyu, she said there are strategic needs and practical needs. And when you're working on, on site, I think it's more the practical needs that you try to support the people that, from the gender perspective, it's important that people have an equal access to space, an equal access and a safe access, I think it's very important. And I think the limit is still that... Um, Planning is very influenced by social things, like as I think two days ago we had the equal pay day. It's still that women uh, um, earn less money, uh, especially elder women have less pension. So there's still, it's not so easy, you can talk about equal access to space, but if, if there's still kind of a gap between income, uh, between men and women, I think this is still structure we in, which influence also the use of space. So we had a, a, a project in the rural area um, 15 years ago, and it was like we were talking about sport uh, facilities. And most of the sport facilities in rural areas are just 15 years ago were just for young boys. Mm -hmm. So we really tried, and and, the, and also the municipality have had understood after our project that they need also facilities for girls because they are as important as the boys. And I think the other thing is um, when you do participatory planning, I think, uh, like as I said, if you have this kind of uh, networks in rural areas, it's quite good to work with them so you can reach the people there and you have to think how you can integrate the different people and how you organize your your participatory things that people get really engaged in these processes. And I think there has done a, there have been a lot of new ideas really to integrate people and I would say there was a big uh, change in how you do participatory planning really to get rich kids to reach uh, young women to reach young people to reach elder people so I think planners discussed this quite a lot the last years in rural but also in, in urban areas. And I think because you ask uh, also to improve in terms of gender justice, one one point is always uh, to have enough uh, uh, that you have like uh, social infrastructure like kindergarten, schools. I think that's an important issue uh, when you talk about gender justice in mm -hmm. rural areas, but also in urban areas. And I think that's much better in urban areas. And it depends also on the provinces, how they organize um uh, kindergartens and schools. I think that has a big influence on the everyday life situation, especially of women with kids, but also family with kids. And so I think that's an important point. And as I said, when we discuss uh, planning, there are yeah, these more practical needs really to think how you can support the everyday life. But on the other uh, uh, hand, you have to really think to really implement it uh, on a strategic level that you have it when we talk about planning, that that you have it in the laws, that you have it in the strategic documents, in the strategic, um, also uh, when you do some like land use plan, that you think about 
how when you do a land use plan, how it uh, affects the different uses. So I think it's important to have these two different uh, levels. Mm -hmm. From my part, I can think more about uh, the urban level because this is the background of my experience. And we have, now I can say it's almost 30 years now, and we have realized different pilot projects and pilot processes and some successes to implement gender issues in mainstream processes on different planning levels. So to summarize, I would say it's... Um, It's very evident and very easy to un understandable if you are on the lowest uh, really design level of, of, of public space. So there it's very clear and very evident. We have um, made, and this is really our ideal, typical story of a gender-sensitive park design, for example, because there it was really from a social scientific research project talking, watching children and youngsters in the parks, talking to them, to uh, and to make it quite clear that we have a problem that girls disappear out at the year of 12 because the, it, the parks do not fit to their design. This was really a, a huge orientation on, on male uh, interests in the parks from the design. And then to realize pilot projects based on that, then to make an evaluation and then again make general guidelines now. So I think this is really a success story. So every design or redesign of Viennese parks is now orientated on this gender planning issues. Here on this level, it, it's quite easy to formulate and you can quite clearly from watching and talking to the uh, to, to the potential user groups who get a very clear picture also in the in in mobility planning so it's really in a historically dense city like vienna where we have quite uh, small uh, streets in in relationship to berlin or paris for example so vienna is really dense and so it's really a fight between centimeters or seconds of traffic light calculation between the different traffic modes so here it's also quite clearly because data show that uh, public transport and walking is female dominated and car use and biking is male dominated and then it's very interesting to have this <laughs> this gendered look on if you have to decide and this is again all the time a conflict of different traffic modes and to in the advantage of which group these decisions are made so here it i think it's really quite clear And so I think we agree that there is there should be a minimum of density of all the reasons for public transport and and shops and shopping facilities and and urban life. You need a certain density, but from the, a gender perspective, there should also be an upper threshold on taking into consideration that it also needs a certain amount of uh, of public areas because it's important also for the health of children and youngsters it's important for for elderly people it's again this local neighborhood orientated population for them it's also quite crucial and therefore we the we We made this uh, definition density of high quality so do also that you also have a have to take care how this density is designed and if there is enough available open space. How did the efforts for gender mainstreaming in Vienna City Planning Authority affect the discussion at large? What role do pioneers have in this space? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the city has really a pioneer role in this. And I think they have a very long tradition in the topic. Uh, they have a longer tradition, I think, since the 90s. So they started with the first um, project in the 90s. And uh, the first project was also an exhibition. It was the exhibition on uh, women's daily life in the city. And this was done by Eva Keiler and also Jutta Kledorf. I think they have done a lot of really... Um, a lot of different projects. The first one was Frauenwerkstatt that was on affordable housing for women. 
a big debate, which is more landscape architecture and landscape planning, was to have uh, gender parks or that, that girls have more access on public parks. That was a big debate also mid in the 90s. And another thing was that they got a special department for this. Uh, I think that was also at the end of the 90s. So they really had, uh, there was a problem with, uh, with uh, three women who really tried to support these ideas and bring it in all different other planning departments. Well, and we so had the chance then at the big, I think it was 2011 or 12, to, to bring all examples together and, and make kind of a systematic book out of it. So we tried uh, together with, not only we did it, we did it with uh, the departments of the city. We brought uh, together all the experience also from land use planning, but also, like I said before, from park planning to bring this idea together. And we discussed this for quite a long time. <laughs> it was also very <laughs> controversial debate. But really to bring it together and say what it is, and I think uh, that that is very important uh, uh, that they have made this book, and and that it was also translated to English. And I think that that was one key point that it's quite affects not only the discussion in Austria, it affects also the European discussion, and it's quite mentioned quite often in, in scientific literature, but also in very practical literature, you find it also on the global scale, on the UN Habitat documents, you always find Vienna. Okay. So I would really say uh, for Vienna, um, it, there was really a huge impact uh, in learning how to do planning. And um, I think also a lot of the rural areas can learn from that processes there is not just yet the awareness of the importance, but I think, yeah, by just knowing the project, by talking about it, I think they can learn or they, they can see the added value that, that integration of the topic brings to all the plannings. And it's actually, it's not really a burden, but I think it's really an added value. So I think at the end, it's important that you still stay positive and that you always talk about the good things, that what impact it has uh, on planning, what are the positive sides, and not it makes planning more complex. Yeah. So I think we are on a good path, but it, for my opinion, it still could be faster. Yeah. But okay, it is how it is. I think that there was quite an influence of gender planning issues in in Vienna in in the in the planning field for example um, when we started 30 years ago nobody spoke about public space and nobody spoke about pedestrian issues because before it was only public transport and individual car traffic so this was really formulated as an important issue from from women's side. So I think this is something really specific in Vienna, and I think we have reached effects in the in the in the mainstream, because for example, before there were always planning lyrics in the strategic documents. There was written also in the older general traffic concepts two meters minimum dimension of sidewalks. But it was just <laughs> there, and it was not taken serious. And it was due to our efforts that this really then become really a policy. Yeah? And it was quite a challenge in the inner districts to realize these two meters yeah, in, the, in the smaller streets. But then it really becomes uh, a real uh, norm which the department had to deal with and, and to handle and to decide. So this, I think, was... this was important and this was really a successful mainstreaming was that this uh, park design and design of public space so I think there was really an improvement in guidelines but also in the in the projects and so I, I dare to say that pedestrian issues really have quite now a quite higher importance than before but of course it's also now the mainstream um, development uh, but I think it, it it, it started earlier in Vienna due to the gender planning approach. And I think the, the, the role of pioneers, I think it always, uh, it's always helpful if in a system certain topics 
have a certain face and person and maybe I or maybe I, I was a bit of pioneer of these planning issues but I also had a lot of support from others uh, there, there was the political level but because if you are working in as a public employee uh, you you really need you are depending on the on the political support so th- this this was very helpful and I had uh, Elisabeth Irschig and Claudia Prince Brandenburg as, as I think we we have been quite a strong team in the 11 years of this coordination office. So we developed a lot of things together. But it was also important that there were external offices, uh, like Plansin uh, and Hanna Posch from Plansin, or Tilia, uh, the, the, uh, the feminist landscape planning offices, because it was also in the, they supported us in many situations, also the architects from Frauenwerkstatt, this first housing project. So I think there, there or, or Sabina Ries, who has made now a dissertation about uh, feminist housing projects, so I think it really needs uh, a network uh, and also on the Technical University, Doris Damjanovic and Petra Hirschler, and there are quite a lot of others, and I think it's, and I think all of them are pioneers in, in their, because we have different professional roles. And what was interesting, there was a woman from the University of Novi Sad, and she was um, staying at the Institute of Doris Damjanovic, I think, for two months. And she was studying about the role of networks, and she described it uh, like a Viennese model. And I, of course, I see, always say I, I am the first one who can tell you what does not work well, <laughs> what are the obstacles and challenges. But sometimes it's also quite helpful to get the view from outside. And and she said she has the impression that it's really this that there are so many different uh, institutions involved. So you have you have the, the, the city itself, you have the, the universities, you have NGOs and um, and this together makes a, uh, estimates she that this was helpful to, to bring forward the, 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 the topic of gender planning issues in Vienna. Gender justice, gender mainstreaming and inclusive practices are breaking paradigms in planning. On our website you can find literature published by our interview partners and in the next episode we will take a look at the international perspectives. Let us know in the comments, is or was gender mainstreaming a topic during your education? What do you think are the most interesting aspects? This was Breaking Paradigms by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchet. Be part of the conversation. If you like what we do, consider supporting us and join our Patreon community. Connect with us on Facebook, YouTube, and at breakingparadigms.org. Content and editing by Constanze Frech and Sarah Couchet. Sound design by Didac Barroso and Florian Frech.